Hey, Chico, that fruit drink you have is pretty good. Oh, yeah. I love it. What's in that fruit drink, as a matter of fact? I want to know. It's a cran grape number, you know? What's in there? Cranberry, grape, maybe a little bit of orange just to cut it. Well, why don't you just put some broccoli in there? Hey, did you hear something, Chico? I didn't hear anything. Uh, did you hear something? Mike, did you hear anything? Can't say I did. Hmm. Theme song. This is It Was a Thing on TV. It's a Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Hey guys, since you're not going to hear much of me this week, I thought I'd do the open for this episode. And I'm not kidding either. You're not going to hear a lot of me. LOL, that's what you think, Mike. Episode 223, submission number 268, Spider-Man from the late 1970s. The Spider-Man series from the late 1970s ran from September 14th, 1977 through July 6th, 1979. And it aired on for two seasons and 13 episodes. This week... Spider-Man No Way Home is coming to a movie theater screen near you. The uh, long-awaited and much-hyped Spider-Man No Way Home. By the way, this is this is my hype face. My hype face. Hype intensifies. Yeah. By the way, did you see today that the, in New York City there was actually like a pop-up Daily Bugle newsstand. I did, actually. So IGN had the um, pictures from the um, booth, and it was actually pretty fun. And the funny part is, the mock Daily Bugle newspaper was sponsored by Liberty Mutual, featuring on the cover, Weebu, Ebu, and Doug. And Doug. That'd be a great cameo in the movie if all of a sudden Libra, Emu, and Doug showed up. And who says that there won't be? Chico, it's three days from release at the time this gets put on our Podbean feed and Marvel Studios still will not admit that Toby and Andrew are in this damn movie. And who says that there won't be? But we're not here to talk about Libra, Emu, or Doug. No. Well, just remember, they do have an ad that promotes the movie. Yes, they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do. They have a, they have an ad where Doug tries becoming Spider Man by putting a big spider, I don't know if it's tarantula or what have you, on his arm, and uh, instead of becoming Spider Man, getting superpowers, uh, he just gets like allergies and put into an ambulance. Oh, that's terrible. That is terrible. Well, who you don't put poisonous spiders on your arm. They even tell you don't do that at home. Don't attempt this, kids. It's a spider. It's don't do this incredibly cool thing. Yeah. No, no. That that's sort of like if you remember we were talking last week about Adam West. Yeah. That's sort of like saying, "Hey, I want superpowers. I'm going to roll around in, uh, in in sewage and toxic waste." I believe we have footage of that. I think Greg did a really good reenactment of it last week. I don't yeah, know if we're going to put the footage in. But yeah, I did as best as I could about reenacting that scene from Family Guy. But, uh, well, as you all know, and me and Chico, if in case you haven't known, we've done a year-long podcast about the movie franchise regarding this, and we kind of talked about it in the pilot episode, but this was really the first Spider-Man live-action thing ever. Mm-hmm. And really, if you don't know they've been doing Into the Spideyverse... Don't worry, Mike, that you messed up the title of Into the Spidey movie verse. Chico did that about five times. Don't stop listening to us and miss the last three minutes of the show. They've only been doing this for months. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's a reason why we've been doing it for the entire year is for this week. It's been if leading this, up to this, right. It's been leading up to this moment. And again, hype intensifies. Brace yourselves, you might want to sit out. Hype intensifies. Yep. And by now, you all know the story of Spider-Man. 
14 year old Peter Parker goes from meek little boy to strapping hunk of superhero, and all it took was the bite of a mutant spider. Ooh! Then from there, he goes wrestling. He tries to wrestle, he succeeds, and ultimately spends his entire young life avenging his uncle's death at the hand of some guy. Some guy. Who killed him? Who knows? Hey, we never found out that answer in the Amazing Spider-Man movies. No. And the thing of it is, they tried to say it was... uh, who they try to say it? It was well, some oh. guy. It was some guy that Peter let go in the beginning of the uh, first Sam Raimi Spider Man. Oh, in the in the Raimi movies, yeah. And then we thought it was. Then it turned out to be Thomas Hayden Church who accidentally killed him. Whether or not he actually did is left up to your own devices. But this uh, TV show, this TV show that aired on CBS, it does not explore. Any of that. No, it doesn't explore any of this. In fact, we are to assume that Uncle Ben is long since passed before the events of the TV show even begin. And Aunt May, too, because I don't think Aunt May's even mentioned, right? Okay, Aunt May is actually in the pilot. Okay, she's in the pilot. She's in the pilot, and, um, and according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia... She's in a number of other episodes, but they're played by different actresses. Oh, it's just a 13-episode show. You can't afford the same actress for the entire run. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, Spider-Man on the cheap. That's next episode. Oh, okay. Spider-Man. But yeah, um, we're going to take a deep dive into the credits here, because I'm pretty sure that they have like all... Of the Aunt May actresses. Okay, so the first actress who played Aunt May was a lady by the name of Jeff Donald. And Mike, I believe you have some information about that. Yeah, her birth name is Jean Marie Donnell. Mm -hmm. She got the nickname Jeff because she liked the Mutton Jeff comic strip so much that she gave herself the nickname Jeff. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. And again, uh, she is sadly no longer with us. I believe she died in 1988. Second one was Irene Tidro, who played Aunt May in Night of the Clones. We'll talk about that in a bit, but um, Irene Tidro also no longer with us. But these were basically... um, when they were cast, they were basically of the mindset that Aunt May is an elderly character. It's certainly not the Marissa Tomei that we know of nowadays, right? Oh, yeah, am I right? <laughs> In fact, one of her roles is that grandma from that thing. Uh, actually, I, I, you know what? Here's a list of, of some of her uh, known roles. Grandma Shandling. Grandma Shandling! It's Gary Shandling's show. Oh, it's Gary Shandling's show! Hell, Hydra. Aunt Martha Bronson from the new Leave It to Beaver. Oh, the new Leave It to Beaver! Amy Yarrow from Punky Brewster. Oh, Mike, say it. Punker. (laughs) Punker, tell Sherry. Don't go in the refrigerator, Punky. Uh, this is <laughs> Punky. T- tell uh, Johnny Brown not to go on that dating show, Punky. Fun fact: It was the Hands Across America episode. Oh yeah, and, well, yeah. We talked. We said that Hands Across America was the thing in 1985. Uh, then there was Nanny Perkins and Remington Steele, and. Several other elderly characters on Quincy Emmy, Trapper John, and future entry, The Last Ninja. What's The Last Ninja? Remember the master 
Oh, so it's like it's that. It's kind of like that. Oh, okay. And, oh, and Mrs. Drummond from Different Strokes. What? Not not, not the uh, Kevin Hart Different Strokes. The real D- Different Strokes. Apparently, oh. she played Philip Drummond's mama. Oh, so she was Arnold's grandma, technically. Basically. Oh, hey, that live in front of a studio audience was very good. The best part was the um, the mock commercial with Bob Vila, Alfonso Ribeiro, and the Kool Aid Man. That was just again and, and again. Special shout out to Steve French for blessing us once again. Oh yeah. With his Ernie Anderson impersonation. Yeah, unfortunately though, you you gotta have like twelve packs of men falls today to authentically replicate Ernie. But eh. You know what? Steve French did fine, okay? All right. All right. So enough about the backstory. The rest of the story writes itself. Spider-Man dons a red and blue costume, fights crime, and juggles life between being a superhero and being a kid going to high school or college or his job at the Daily Bugle. That's the story, and we're sticking to it. So, how does this translate to a TV show? Well, again, according to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia... Uh, Stan Lee approached CBS with a deal to make the Spider-Man show after, what, what, a year or two of it being part of the Electric Company? Yes. Oh, the Electric Company skits from Spider-Man. Oh, those were great. Spider-Man, where are you coming from, Spider-Man? Nobody knows who you are. Okay, true believers, here he is, your friendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. Today's episode, Spidey meets the Spoiler. Oh, uh, yes, they were they were indeed great. And the thing of it is, they wanted to make a movie of Spider-Man. And they did make this, and they made like a 90-minute feature of Spider-Man. It was released theatrically, internationally. By uh, Dan Goodman and Charles Freeze. And for, was uh, for Columbia. Mm-hmm. And ironically, who would go on to distribute the Spider Man movies? Columbia. Of course, Stan Lee and Daniel Goodman had creative differences. Stan Lee was creative, Daniel Goodman was different. No, uh, Stan Lee went on record in an interview saying, he thought that the series, as Daniel Goodman envisioned it, was, and now I'm quoting, too juvenile. Wow. I mean, he wanted, I mean, he wanted a Spider-Man with gravitas. And if you know what goes on in Stan Lee's mindset, because, again, this is the crown jewel of Stan Lee's comics empire. Oh, yeah, he was the guy, Spider-Man. Around yes. 1977. And he wasn't the, just the superhero. He was a man, too. I mean, he wasn't the, uh, just a guy in a costume. No, this was a kid. The appeal of Spider-Man is he's just a regular guy who has problems like everybody else. Yep. He has problems. He has superpowers. And it's almost like the superpowered guy is taking a backseat to Peter Parker. Oh, yeah. Almost. The regular cast, there are 13 episodes, and the only people who appear in all 13 are Peter Parker, obviously, his boss at the Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson, and Rita Conway, who is a character created for this series. Of course, donning the red and blue suit, well, theater of the mind here, just go with us on this, as Peter Parker is, uh, again, singer-actor Nicholas Hammond. And, of course, you would know him best as Friedrich from The Sound of Music. 
the hills are alive with the sound of music. Please that- don't quit your day job, Greg. Mike, how'd you like that? Oh, you're doing your impression of Yankees thumbs down guy. Uh, yeah, but yeah, before before Spidey, he was uh, that young guy from that thing. He oh, was- hold on, time out. Whammy's here. Whammy, what do you have to say about my singing? I'm giving you a thumbs down. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Whammy. You make yep. me want to give money away to people. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's how bad it is. You're making me crazy. But yeah, he was in episodes of Hawaii Five-0, Family, uh, Future Entry, Petricelli, Eight is Enough, and The Love. We talked about him on the Love Boat guest stars episode. And he's had many roles since. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, his latest one was as Sam Watermaker in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, yes. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, what a great movie that was. Oh. And playing the role of J. Jonah Jameson... It's sort of a departure from uh, the sort of fast-talking cartoon character slash J.K. Simmons portrayal is Robert F. Simon. I mean, yes, he's a little slower. That's what I want to say. He's a little slower. No, well, J.K. Simmons is, like, very high-strung. Yes, yeah, J.K. Simmons, high-strung. Robert F. Simons, not so much. Nope. But he did look the part. He did. So, he did look the part. He just, he was, you can tell he didn't have his coffee this morning. Yeah. And the third person who appeared in all 13 episodes, Rita Conway, was played by Chip Fields, who is known less for roles in Good Times and What's Happening at Days of Our Lives, and and more for being Kim's Mama. Kim's Mama? Kim's Mama. On what? No, seriously. Chip Fields is Kim Fields' mama. Oh oh, oh, oh! oh! That makes sense. Yes. In fact, she plays 2D Ramses' mom on in the two facts. episodes of The Facts of Life. Oh, that's amazing! And 12 episodes of Living Single. Oh my god! <laughs> She was on Living Single also playing I'm, Kim I'm waiting for I'm waiting for like a, a string of episodes where she appears as as uh Kim Fields' character's mother on the Upshaw on Netflix. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be that would be incredible. Okay. Well, oh, I think we had two uh, different actors in different seasons coming up right here. And playing the role in season one of Captain Barbera is Michael Pataki. And hey, do you know what Michael Pataki's best known for? Is he related to George Pataki? I don't know. Yeah, I was say, don't say he's related to No, George. he's not related to George. He's the evil Russian handler of Drago in Rocky IV. Ooh. He's the guy who says, whatever he hits, he destroys. Yep, Nikolai Koloff, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no relation to uh, Nikolai Volkov or Ivan Koloff or Nikita Koloff or any of those other Russian wrestlers. And since it all goes back to Star Trek The Next Generation, he played Cardis in the episode Too Short a Season from 1988. Oh. Was, was that a Pulaski episode, Chico? Oh, God. Not a Pulaski episode. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just want to have an excuse to play the scene where Diana Molnar went down the elevator shaft again. Let's play it right here. I really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Rosalind! Oh my god! <laughs> oh no. Stop it. <laughs> and introduced in season two as a potential love interest for Peter Parker. Woo! 
It's not Mary Jane. It's, it's not, not Gwen Stacy. No. Jinx by Mia Coke. It is Julie Masters. Julie Masters? Who that, that girl be? Oh, she's played by someone we know very well on this podcast. Mm hmm. Ellen Bree. Of course, she of St. Elsewhere. Yeah. Which means she's in the universe. Oh, in the Tommy Westfall universe? Yeah. What if the entire Spider Verse Chico was created by Tommy Westfall? Then we would have two conflicting uh, universes collapsing within each other. Maybe he's the OG He Who Remains Chico. Maybe he's the OG He Who Remains. It's time for a match game. Highwood Squares. Our reference! And she appeared on at least two weeks of Match Game Hollywood Scores Hour. Oh, yeah, Ellen Bree. Yeah. All right. So we have our entire cast, and we have uh, Los Angeles doubling as New York City. New York City! And we have, oh, we have one more character who was in the comics, but uh, was only in one episode of the show. Okay. Who's that? Joe Robertson, Robbie Robertson. Ooh. Played by Hilly Hicks. Okay. And of course, he would be uh, best known for. He's best known as Lewis Harvey, aka the younger son of Alex Haley's second great grandfather, Chicken George, in Roots. Oh, okay. The original Roots. The original Roots, yes. Roots! So all of those people to some degree, were a part of uh, Spidey's world here. So how does this all translate to television? Hmm. I guess we're going to have to find out. Episodes? Here we go. The first one was the pilot, and it aired on September 14th, 1977. And of course, this was the 90-minute movie that was distributed uh, in theaters internationally. University student Peter Parker is bitten by a radioactive spider and decides to use his superpowers to stop an evil New Age guru that is turning law-abiding citizens into criminals through mind control. Oh, mind control. Yeah. Mind control. Because... It seems like they got the Spider-Man character, but they didn't get any of the Sinister Six. I don't know. Yeah, they couldn't translate Doc Ock in 1977. To Not with 1977 television technology. No. Maybe you could uh, replicate the Green Goblin, I guess, but I don't know. Well, it could replicate Spider-Man swinging and mm. crawling. Although, if you looked at him crawling, it was... It, kind of terrible. Kind of terrible, yeah. Yeah. The guy who played Dave, who I'm guessing was just a guy, Larry Anderson. Not that Larry Anderson, not I don't the, think. Not, not the baseball player, I don't think. Not, no, not, not him. Uh, we're talking about the, uh, the dad from Life with Lucy. Oh! And, yeah. The dad, dad, which means he'd be uh, Jenny Lewis's dad, right? Right, which means he was the host of the Big Spin and the New Truth of Consequences mm. and Panorama. Panorama? What the hell's Panorama? It's a documentary series. Which means he is also the doctor who delivered the triplets in This Is Us. Oh my god, really? Mm hmm. So he's responsible, I guess, technically for delivering Justin Hortley. Yeah. Well, good that for guy. good for him. Good for him. So yeah, a known entity. Well, we do have other names as well. We have playing Monahan, and we've mentioned him in the past. Bob Hastings. Oh, Bob Hastings. Well, he was known for doing voices particularly later in his life. But one place that we've talked about him, I don't think we're going to cover it, 
is he was the first host of Dealer's Choice. Dealer's Choice. I remember that show. That was a good show. Well, he was the uh, first host on Dealer's Choice because he said a little oopsie regarding uh, a phrase about uh, someone's ethnicity. Oh. We won't repeat it here just because, uh, well, if it was taboo in 1973 or 1974, it sure as heck is taboo in 2021. Yes. It was wrong then. It's wrong now. Yeah. And we we did talk about him recently because he appeared in an episode of Kolchak the Night Stalker. Okay. But but, but he has plenty of voiceover credits uh, for cartoons. And he also apparently did at least four episodes of one of Greg's favorite shows, Love American Style. Well, no, it's not the new Love American Style, Mike. Oh, I was hoping you'd sing Love American Style. <laughs> Truer than the Red Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I we should all just stop. Anyway. And p- playing a news alert reporter is Ivan Bonar. Ivan Bonar. We've talked about him. I don't know if we talked about him here, but he was on an episode of Jennifer Slept Here. Okay. Yeah, we definitely talked about him when we were talking about uh, Jennifer Slept Here. Well, I wasn't. At length. Well, and also we did talk about him, or at least mention him, in Sanford. He was in an episode of that. Okay. Yep. So uh, we'll go back to the Sanford verse episodes from fall of 2020. Episode two, The Deadly Dust, part one. A group of students steal plutonium from NYU. To make matters worse, a Miami reporter arrives in New York to get an exclusive interview with Spider-Man and won't leave Peter alone until she gets it. And this involves an international business arms dealer named Mr. White. No, not the guy from the James Bond movies. But no. this Mr. White is played by, and we've talked about this Mr. White a couple of times on this podcast, Robert Alda. Yep. He- From S- Super Trade. And Alan Alda's daddy. Alan Alda's dad. And also, he was on the Love Boat. At this point, who wasn't on the Love Boat? Anyway. And playing the role of Gail Hoffman... Oh, mighty Isis herself, Joanna Cameron, sadly, no longer with us. Yeah. Yeah, just died like two months ago. Yeah. But yeah, we did mention her indirectly in the Ghostbusters episode because uh, Ghostbusters got canceled because the secrets of Isis needed more money. And Filmation said, nope, goodbye, second best uh, rated show on Saturday mornings. We need to put money into the top-rated show on Saturday mornings. Oh, and playing Inspector DiCarlo in this episode is Sidney Clute, who I think we've mentioned in the past because he was on Cagney and Lacey. I believe we might have, but I'm taking a look to see what else he was doing because... Uh... Yeah, he he was a that guy from that thing. So. Yeah, I I know we've talked about him in the previous episode. Yeah, I'll just try to figure out which pre. Oh, Colcheck the Night Stalker. That's oh, what we was. did. That explains it. Okay, he was on Colcheck the Night Stalker. Second reference to Colcheck the Night Stalker. Play the role of Carla Wilson. This would be before HBO came calling with not necessarily the news. Annie Bloom. Annie Bloom. Yeah, good call. Good comic news anchor. Great pyramid player. Apparently still active. Way active. Uh, She was in a previous installment, Nightstand, as Rhonda. She plays Parker Lewis's mom on Parker Lewis. On Parker Lewis Can't Lose. That means her on-screen husband would be Timothy Stack. Which now the nightstand appearance makes sense. It does make a lot of sense. Oh, and by the way, guys, next year we're going to be discussing something Corin Nimick was in. Be on the lookout for that. Yes. Because as we all know, Parker Lewis, he can't lose. 
Because you know what? If he turned up and helped Spider-Man fight the Green Goblin, you know Spider-Man would win, because as we all know, Porco Lewis, he can't lose. Was Green Goblin and Doc Ock were up against Parker Lewis. Well, Parker Lewis would beat both of them. Listen, Chico, it's right there in the name. <laughs> Parker Lewis can't lose. That's Don't even come up with hypothetical scenarios where, oh, oh, he could lose. What happens if he does this? He can't lose. It's right there. It's in the title. He can't lose. Exactly. I love these heart to hearts. Well, don't challenge logic. It's right there. Okay. okay. Oh. Well, uh, what's the conclusion to this episode? The conclusion to this episode is uh, episode three, actually. The Deadly Dust. Part two. Yes. Peter and Gail follow the plutonium thieves to LA, and JJ, who has paid for the trip, insists on going along. Because reasons. Okay. But there, Mr. White is threatening to explode the device if his demands one billion dollars in gold aren't met. Oh. He wants one billion dollars. Or he's gonna blow up Los Angeles. Well, good luck with that. Meanwhile, Mr. White proceeds with his plans to detonate the bomb during the president's speech in Los Angeles, but during preparation, a female member of his trio succumbs to acute radiation poisoning. While Spider-Man is intent on thwarting the bomb's detonation, he's also torn between helping the dying woman. This is Peter Parker in a nutshell. Because, yes, he has to be the hero and has to save the world, but at the same time, he can't ignore the person who's dying. No. And many of the people who are in the first episode are also in the second episode, because this is a two-parter, so. Episode 4. The Curse of Rava. Mysterious accidents occur at the Bolt Museum when it is displaying Rava, the Kalistani god of death. J.J. Jameson, one of the museum's backers, ends up in jail on suspicion of attempting to kill his financial partner. Peter Parker tries to clear his boss's name so the Beagle won't change hands, meaning he will lose his job. Wow, what a rare episode. Mr. Jameson being helped by Peter Parker. For attempted murder. No For less. attempted murder, everyone. Sure, J. Jonah Jameson, he might be terrible in trying to frame Peter Parker, but he's not going to stand for his boss being accused of attempted murder. Nope, he's going to put his foot down. Nope. And leading the charge with the Curse of Rava is a character named Mandak, played by Theodore Bickle. And really, the best way to describe his career is that ethnic character from that TV show. A lot of uh, Eastern European names on his credits. Oh. Nothing wrong with that. It sort of kind of fits the stereotyping we kind of mentioned last couple of episodes. We talked about Mr. Whipple being a drunk. And we talked about the guy from uh, The Last Precinct always playing Elvis. somebody named Elvis, Elvis or the King. Yeah. So it's sort of like a, a lot of Russian, Eastern European names. Okay. Episode five, Night of the Clones. Oh, and do you know who directed this episode, guys? You look marvelous. You really do. Simply marvelous. Fernando Lamas, that's right. Lorenzo Lamas' dad directed this episode. And remember, he's better to look good than to be good. And of course, we're going to mention Lorenzo Lamas. I can't say it. Sadly, and, his wife, Arlene Dahl, is no longer with us. Well, yeah, that, that's sad. But I, I'm just thinking we're going to talk about Lorenzo Lamas in uh, Joe Schmo, the, the, the full, reboot. Oh, boy. Yeah, the full bounty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a great yeah. season. Oh, boy. oh, that's going to be an episode and a half. Oh, a scientific convention is being held in New York City, and a controversial American scientist has figured out a way to clone human beings, only to have his evil clone try and escape and clone an evil Spider-Man. What? Oh, my God, it's a clone episode. 
I guess he doesn't become Ben Riley. I guess the evil clone. And the police get a description of the person who did it, and it's the scientist. Oh. But how could he have been there when he was at the demonstration? Huh? He must be a clone. Huh? Peter suspects that the motive that is that the group refuses to honor the scientist's work, so he goes to see the head of the group, who confirms Peter's suspicions that they refused to honor him because he didn't want the scientist to clone a man, which he did himself. Who, in turn, after getting a sample of Spider-Man's DNA, clones him. No. Uh-oh. 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 Hey, guys. Playing Lisa Benson in this episode. Are you ready? This is probably the biggest name of this series, okay? I'm oh, listening. yeah. This is a big one. Morgan Fairchild. Oh, yeah. That's the ticket. Yeah, that's the ticket. It's time for a match game. Hollywood Squares. Our reference. And hey, let's go for a, a very obtuse match game Hollywood Squares reference. She made a walk on onto the set during one of the last episodes because across the hall, she was recording a special with Rodney Dangerfield. I'm not kidding. Uh, Don, would you uh, uh, take Lisa with you for a second here while I greet another person here? This beautiful woman walking on stage right now is Morgan Fairchild. Hi. Hi. In the studio next door to us, what's the activity going on next door? We're taping a Rodney Dangerfield special. Yes. I've been everything from Bonnie and Clyde to watching Rodney be a merman today. <laughs> <laughs> this is a thrill <laughs> I saw a little of it And it's going to be a very funny show Is that going to be on sometime soon? Uh, I think it's going, to, it's going to be on in the fall They don't have an exact date Yeah, yeah. You're gorgeous you have to sit on it for a while and wait It's All a right. hot show, folks Well, we shall look forward to seeing you, Morgan well, I saw you. a little bit of it And she's, you do a wonderful southern accent That's Texas, honey it, uh, Texas, well, whatever it is It's, it's got a real it's twang to it It's country <laughs> Uh, I'm going to stand here with Morgan Fairchild. This is the only chance I'm going to have to put my arm around someone this beautiful. And uh, during the two minutes break, you know what I'll be doing. I don't know what you're going to be doing. And this would be the second episode with uh, Aunt May as played by Irene Tidro. Episode six, Escort to Danger. Peter covers the arrival of a foreign president who comes to attend the beauty pageant his daughter is joining. He sees a man who is approaching the president, abducted, but fails to save him. Later, he gets to be his daughter's escort. Later, she's abducted, and the president wants the whole thing kept quiet. The president is later visited by a woman who appears to be the sister of the tyrannical president. He deposed, wants to resign, and named the new president. Why didn't they get Billy Barty and have her dwarf and a magician to help stop the president? Because that would make too much sense in comparison. But hey, playing the president in this episode, a, a very known name, Alejandro Ray. Oh, Alejandro Ray. He was best known for uh, being on the Flying Nun. Oh. Yep. And actually, he was like a semi-recurring celebrity on What's My Line back in the 60s and 70s. Oh, Hey, and hey, we, stuff like Tattletales. But yeah. hey, we, we got another name in this episode. Playing Matsu in this episode is Harold Sakata, who you would best know as Odd Job from Goldfinger. Nice. Oh, that's nice. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah Odd Job. The guy with the hat. The guy with the hat, yes. And that's for, all you need to know. The guy with the hat. The guy with the hat. Who would be made famously fun of in uh, Austin Powers with the guy who threw the shoe? Who throws Random a sh- task? Random task. Who throws a shoe? Honestly. Uh, do I need to find the footage of the person who threw a shoe at? Uh, who was that? Was that uh, President was Bush? It was Bush. Yeah. Yeah. In Iraq, it was like one of his last things he did as president was he got a shoe thrown at him. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, we went out on a high note, I guess. And he seemed like he enjoyed it. Okay. Oh, we got another name in this episode. Playing the daughter of the president in this episode is another known entity. Madeline Stowe. I know that name. Yes. She was in 12 Monkeys. Yes, 12 Monkeys with uh, Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt. She was the love interest for Bruce Willis and 12 Monkeys. She'd be a little too old to be the love interest of Brad Pitt. Well, yeah, because wasn't Brad Pitt like that psycho guy in the ward who was trying to free all the animals? Yes. Brad Pitt was the psycho. Yes. Okay, so that's season one. So now we're on to season two. And we start with episode seven, The Captive Tower. Thieves steal $10 million from a new high-tech security building and use its computers to trap the people inside. And, yeah, it begins with uh, Peter and J. Jonah Jameson attending the opening of a new building. Some guys come in, take control, lock everybody in a room, and demands money, or he'll kill everyone. Hmm. Any known entities? Uh, this would be the first episode with Julie Masters as played by Ellen Bree. And uh, aside from that, I don't see much of the way of known entities. Okay, let's move on to uh, episode 8, A Matter of State. Defense plans are stolen and held for ransom by terrorists. Joy Masters accidentally gets a photograph of the ringleader of the gang, and now Spider-Man has to protect Masters while also trying to get the defense plans back. Playing in this episode, the character of Evans is John Crawford. And John Crawford, he played Sheriff Bridges on the Waltons. And he was on, oh, Mike, he was on three episodes of previous entry, The Powers of Matthew Starr. Ah. I'm having bad flashbacks. Don't talk about that show. Holy cow! Uh, Did you talk about James Victor as Lieutenant Martinez yet? No, I have not. James Victor plays Lieutenant Martinez. Okay, who's James Victor? He played the eccentric grandpa on Condo. Oh, that's right, he was! He was on the eccentric grandfather on condo who, like, knocked down that wall of the baby's room in the condo, right? Completely above board, I should say. Completely above board, I'm sure. The landlord had no problem with it. The Tomorrow's Association totally had a problem with it. He had enough money to pay any sort of fines. I'm sure McLean Stevenson had plenty of money to take care of it. Okay. Episode 9, The Con Caper. An imprisoned politician is released and poses as a reformed humanitarian dedicated to prison reform in order to stage a breakout of some prisoners and steal a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars in 1978 money. Hey, some guy wanted a billion dollars in gold, all right? He, if you ask me, this guy, whoever this guy is, didn't shoot high enough. Okay, playing McTeague in this episode is Andrew Robinson. And Andrew Robinson, actually, as of the time of recording, is still with us. But he is a perennial that guy from that thing. He's been on a bunch of shows. He's been on Matt Houston. He's been on uh, Heart to Heart, The Dukes of Hazard, Falcon Crest. Vegas, uh, Barnaby Jones. He was on an episode of Chips. Oh, he played the character of Frank Ryan on Ryan's Hope for two seasons. Wow. Oh, and he was on two episodes of Kojak. Yep. And in a small role as the IFMM receptionist is Pat Corley, who is known as that redneck sheriff from that thing. No, no, wait a second. You gotta give him some Hold on, hold on, time out, time out. I forgot something about Andrew Robinson, okay? Okay. Chico, he was Garrick on Deep Space Nine! What? (laughs) Yes! Nice! Okay, now that you trampled all over me and Chico talking about Pat Corley, where you guys would best know him from he was Phil the bartender on Murphy Brown, the original series. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember him, like, you remember from that. I remember him from roles in Hill Street Blues, where he played the coroner, Carter Wally Nidor, and also, uh, he was actually in, I kid you not, Saved by the Bell Wedding in Las Vegas. Oh my god. As the redneck sheriff. Oh, We'll eventually get to see by the Bell wedding in Las Vegas. I watched finally the second season premiere of the new Saved by the Bell on Peacock. So did I. It basically picks up in that whole darkest ending to a sitcom ever, if you remember that. How season and one it's like, ended. It's like season one ended. Mac looked at his phone and said, What's coronavirus? <laughs> and now it picks up exactly where it left off a year later. Yeah, everybody's coming back to uh, Bayside. Bayside, and that, that's a, you know what? That's the subject for the year in review show. Yeah, we'll talk about season two, I guess, in the uh, year in review shows. But okay, uh, who else do we got? Oh, we got some guy named Ramon Berry. I think that's how you Ramon pronounce it. Ramon, Ramon Bieri. What is and he? He played the role of Kate in this episode, but. He was known as Gene Galecki on four episodes of Seen Elsewhere. Oh! So he's in the universe! Oh, okay. I'm guessing Ellen Bray had had an in to get him on that show. Maybe. I guess so. And sadly, no longer with us. Oh. We're getting to the end, folks. We are getting there. Okay. Episode 10, The Kirkwood Haunting. Peter Parker is sent to the estate, complete with its own zoo, of a wealthy widow and a longtime family friend of Mr. Jameson. The widow claims that she is being visited by the ghost of her dead husband, and he is telling her to donate all her money to the group of men that are acting as objective investigators of paranormal phenomenon. That sounds like an episode of the Ghostbusters, actually. No, uh, Jonah basically asks Peter to prove that a ghost sighting at the estate is a scam to get the widow to change her late husband's will, while Julie tries to get the scoop, too, but forgets about the wild animals roaming the zoo. Oops. Oops. Any known entities in this episode? I got one. Playing the role of Dr. Davis in this episode is Peggy McKay. If you know your afternoon stories, you would recognize her as Carolyn Brady on Days of Our Lives. Ooh. She's, she's been on Days of Our Lives. She was on between 1983 and 2017. 1,694 episodes. Wow. See, Sweetie's mama. I don't know. I don't know how the Brady family works. As long as she's not Tom's mom. Insert Alex Guerrero HGH joke here. And... Playing Gans in this episode is Paul Carr. Not with us any longer, but uh, you would recognize him among other roles. He was in the original Star Trek. Oh, what episode? He was in the episode where no man has gone before. Oh, the sounds second, like maybe a pilot? The second pilot. It's a second pilot because the first pilot with Jeffrey Hunter was the cage. He was Lieutenant Lee Kelso. Okay. So he folds in nicely into the Star Trek universe, which I know you guys love. Well, we already mentioned the next generation, and we already mentioned Garrick from Deep Space Nine. So, all right. Episode 11, Photo Finish. While doing a story on a rare coin collection, the coins are stolen in a robbery. With one of the thieves wearing a wig and muffling his voice to appear to be the coin collector's bitter ex-wife, the photo that Parker has of the disguised thief will falsely frame the ex-wife and Parker is willing to go to jail in order to protect the innocent and break out of jail as Spider-Man to bring the thieves to justice. Peter talks to the dealer's ex-wife who could resemble the woman in the picture and it turns out the dealer is behind it and trying to frame said ex-wife. Please think Peter didn't give him all the pictures, so he's arrested. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So many guest stars in this episode. We have Jeffrey Lewis, who has been in damn near everything, it seems like. Known mainly as Willis P. Dunleavy in the short-lived Land's End from 1995, and Frank Murphy in the even shorter-lived Maximum Security in 1984, and even shorter-lived Gunshy from 1983. 
Well, he did have one, well, sort of long series, kind of, sort mm-hmm. of. Kind of, he sort played, of. He, he played Earl Tucker on Flow back in the early 80s. Oh, Kiss by Grits. Oh, tw- 29 episodes. Oh. Huh. Yep. But that's not the only name we have. Playing the lieutenant in this episode is Charles Hade. He was Officer Renko on Hill Street Blues. Oh. 144 episodes. Oh, that's pretty good. Episode 12, Wolfpack. Sadly, Kevin Nash is not in this episode. Or Mike what? Tyson, for that or, matter. Or Mike Tyson. When a greedy Sorgensen chemical representative learns that university students have developed a mind control gas, he uses the gas to take control of the students and even some soldiers to commit crimes. Okay, I got a name on this episode. All right. Playing I the think ro- you know, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I know where you're going here. Playing the role of David, and sadly recently passed away back in September, is Gavin O'Hurlihy, who you'd best know as the son of Dan O'Hurlihy. And, okay, guys, Gavin O'Hurlihy, best known as Chuck Cunningham from Happy Days. Yeah, that's right. Also, guys, okay, he also played Kim Basinger's brother in Never Say Never Again. And he also played that jerk. Oh, Chico, we talked about that jerk Brad in Far From Home. Guess what? Oh, God. Gavin O'Hurley, he played a jerk named Brad in Superman 3. He actually played Annette O'Toole's boyfriend in that movie. That bastard. He's the reason why Superman became a drunk. Oh, God. F that guy. Also, he played a Mountie in the second season of Twin Peaks when Agent Cooper got arrested for being at that nightclub that was owned by Ben Horn when he crossed the border. Oh, and Greg? Yeah? Since I know you love any good reference to this show, he was on an episode of 18 Wheels of Justice. Oh, that's right. He was on 18 Wheels of Justice. Future entry 18 Wheels of Justice. Oh, you're darn right. Oh, Oh, yeah. Somebody on YouTube, please upload the episodes in English, please, so we can do an episode about it. I'm begging somebody. Oh, did you mention who played Ben Sorgensen in this episode? Who played him? Lieutenant Kaniski himself, Dolph Sweet. Oh, yes, Dolph Sweet. from. Yeah, that's where I thought you were going. I thought you were going to mention him first. Oh, well... I forgot to mention Dolph Sweet. Yeah, from uh, Give Me a Break. Rest in peace, Dolph. Okay, so now we're on the final two episodes. Okay, first we got the Chinese Web. An old college friend of Mr. Jameson fleeing China, where he is the Minister of Industrial Development, to live with his Chinese-American daughter because the Chinese government has falsely charged him with being a spy during World War II. While Peter tries to prove the man's innocence, he must contend with a henchman of a British Hong Kong businessman who will do anything to get a new Minister of Industrial Development who will ensure that his firm gets a lucrative business contract with Hong Kong. Okay. But playing in this episode, Emily Chan, and we talked about her in Aftermath, Rosalind Chow. Yeah, that was Jamie Farr's wife. Yeah, but also, Chico, we talked about Deep Space Nine. Second reference to Deep Space Nine, because she's Chief O'Brien's wife. Yep. Keiko O'Brien. Yes. Deep yeah. Space Nine. Can't get enough of talking about Deep Space Nine. You really can't. And playing the role of Major Collins. Oh, yes! You know, I said Morgan Fairchild was the biggest name. All right, forget that. This is the no. biggest name of the guest stars on this show. Chico, say it. Ted Danson. Ted Danson. And really, you know, if, if you, don't, if you if don't know who Ted Danson is... Again, bye. stop! Boy, bye! Stop! Boy, bye! You have lost the contest... <laughs> Get out of here. You have lost. Thank you for playing. We have lovely party gifts for you. Exits that way. Yeah. Cheers. Becker. The good place. Mr. Mayor. CSI. Yeah. That's all you need to know. You know who Ted Dancer is. Please, really. Again, we didn't even have to say anything past cheers and Becker. You know who Ted Danson is. That's right. Yeah. And finally... The second part of the Chinese web. Peter goes to China with Dent and Emily so that Dent can prove Emily's uncle's innocence. But the industrialist tries to stop them. 
Well, I guess he stops them. He must stop them. Otherwise, well, where are they going to go with this? Hmm. Now, uh, interesting thing, because the show is pretty well rated, but CBS, when they aired these episodes, tried the uh, bold for its time sort of strategy of airing these in some sort of crazy order at the craziest times. Like, they went to air, like, season two pretty much aired. Spider-Man episodes one time almost every three months during sweeps. So they used it as a sweep stunt. They used it as a sweep stunt. Whereas season one, they aired all six episodes within a couple of months. Season two, episode one aired in September. Episode two aired also in September. Episode three aired in November. Episode four aired in December. Episode five aired in February along with episode six, and the Chinese Web episodes aired in July. Oh yeah, because there is July sweeps. Yes. Not many people know about it, but yeah, there's sweeps in July. Yeah, and even with all of that going on, it still had a lot of ratings, a lot of buzz. It was still a very solid show. So, what happened? Well, chalk it up to less of ratings and more of uh, network politics. According to an article from Back Issue, the chief reason for CBS canceling Spider-Man was that CBS was fearing being perceived as a one-dimensional, superficial superhero network. Yeah, because they had uh, Incredible Hulk and they had Wonder Woman at this time. So it's like, oh, yeah. And they had Shazam and Isis on Saturday morning. That's true. They did have Shazam and Isis on Saturday morning. And apparently they also had options for Doctor Strange and Captain America. How would a Doctor Strange live action series in the late 70s work? I have absolutely no idea. So you have all of those. And the ironic thing is, 40 or so years later, CBS would be half owner of the CW. Oh who yeah, is, which is yeah. basically the DC Channel. The DC Channel, with uh, other shows thrown in, just for an air of legitimacy. Yeah, occasionally get your like crazy ex girlfriends from Sheen the Virgin. Your crazy, your crazy ex girlfriends. Your all Americans. Your legends of the hidden temples is your Jane the Virgins. Your Jane the Virgins is, your Whose Line Is It Anyways is. And actually, in 2022, the American version of What I Lie to You. And don't forget all the uh, Penn and Teller stuff. And uh, I love the Penn and Teller stuff. Well, it gives and, Alice and, and also Han- Masters of Illusion. Yeah, it's true. But the Penn and Teller stuff I love because it gives Alice and Hannigan work. He loves Alice and Hannigan. Yeah. That's never a bad thing. Nope. Okay. Aside from the erratic scheduling, it was reported that San Lee, not really a fan of this particular depiction of Spider-Man. No, he thought this was NG, no good. Why is that? I mean, if you ask me, Nicholas Hammond, he pretty much owns the role. Now, the suit actor was not Nicholas Hammond, obviously. No. But yeah, I mean, it just seems like this show had everything going for it, except for, well... CBS wasn't backing it, and Stanley wasn't backing it. It was odd. Yeah. And also, it probably didn't help that they aired this at, like, random points. Mm-hmm. as like a sweep stunt, so... Whatever. Yeah. Well. And the ironic thing is, The Incredible Hulk was still on until 1982. Yeah. It was a monster <laughs> hit. Yeah, and there was talk of uniting Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk yeah, for a TV movie. Yeah, we talked about this, yeah. Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk were supposed to be in a made for, but I guess apparently, like, Lou Ferrigno got cold feet or something. 
Uh, yeah, well, Hammond wanted to write alongside Ron Satloff and Stan Lee, and Bill Bixby was going to be in it, and Lou Brigno was going to be in it, but Universal canceled the project because of budget. Oh. Well, that stinks. I would have loved to have seen the Spider-Man Incredible Hulk team up. Considering that next year we're going to be talking about the Incredible Hulk teaming up with Thor. Stay tuned for that next year, around the time Thor Love and Thunder comes out. And another interesting little tidbit here. During the course of this series, they wanted to make Superman vs. Spider-Man in the comics. Yeah, that is true. They did do that in the comics. Yeah, they wanted to do a film, Superman vs. Spider-Man. But uh, that did not um... work out. No. I'm guessing Warner Brothers was like, nope. Yeah, they wanted to make it into a film. It ended up being a comic. But the thing of it is, they already have a Superman film and a Spider-Man film at that same time. So that would have been hard. Did audiences really want to see Christopher Reeve against Nicholas Hammond? No. No. Um, Ultimately, the episodes were spliced together as made-for-TV movies and did really well, so... Yeah. So that's the legacy, I guess, of the 1970s Spider Man. Which, by the way, takes place in Earth 730911 of the Marvel Universe, in case anybody asks. Well, what can we say about the 1970s Spider Man series? Well, before Tom Holland, before Andrew Garfield, and even before Toby Maguire, we had Nicholas Hammond, and it was very primitive, and it sure wasn't as nice looking as the Spider-Man movies that we've got in the last 20 years. But in the late 1970s, this was a thing on TV. It sure was. And it wasn't a bad thing on TV, it just was... Kind of chintzy looking. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. Nicholas Hammond ran so Toby, Andrew, and Tom could walk. That makes sense. But we're not done exploring the wonderful world of Spider-Man because over on the other side of the world, we're about to go into an incredibly different direction. What? Wait a minute. Does that mean Spider-Man? That's next time on It Was a Thing on TV. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out all of our episodes on It Was a Thing on TV.com. And we'll see you next week. Wow! Hey, Joe, picking up. Hey, Peter Parker, my number one customer. Fourth time this week. Yeah, well, you know me, I just love dry cleaning. That's what I love about you. A lot of these millennials, they don't care about dry cleaning. They got washing machines. It's disgusting, quite frankly. Sad. Really, anyway, really let me sad. get your stuff here. And, oh, that's you, right? That's me, yes. Thank All you right. so much. Oh, my God. Hey, kid, listen, it's uh, not my business to get into your personal balls or whatever, but uh, can I ask you a question? Mm, yeah, sure. Why are you getting your pajamas cleaned every two days? Because I, uh, I sweat a lot when I sleep. I have a sweaty syndrome, sweaty sleep syndrome. You're a sweaty Betty. That's right, that's correct. My brother was like that. He you know? was? Oh, yeah, he used to, it was like a puddle. We slept on bunk beds. He'd be on top dripping on me all night. Oh, man. It's disgusting. It's yeah. not good. What about the holes? The, ho- the yeah, holes? Yeah, the holes. It almost looked like if uh, some kind of a mechanical octopus arm had taken a chunk out of the fabric. That's easy to explain. Um, it's the, uh, um... Moths? Moths. That's Massive what I thought moths, it was. right? Anyway, I don't see my mask in here. Do you have my mask? Oh, Connie, where's his mask? Under the counter, stupid. Under here? Oh, all right. All right. Hey, oh, Connie. here we go. That's you, right? No, that's Matt's mask. Mine's the one with the white eyes. Oh, right, 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 right. All right, here you go. That's Wade's mask. White eyes. Honey, it's Wade's mask. Okay, I don't care.
Red one, <laughs> real red. White ice. That's yeah, that's you, right? One. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Breaking news, New York's very own Spider-Man swung into action this afternoon on the Brooklyn Bridge, saving a bunch huh? of senior citizens from certain death. Thanks to the mass hero's efforts, all 35 people on the bus returned home safely. Ending up all on the TV. He's got the same goofy PJs you got. He does. Hey, I know what's going on here. You are an influencer. <laughs> What do you want, Instagram or Snapface? Snapface, yeah. Connie, he's on Snapface. Ooh, I like Snapface. <laughs> hey, give the place a little plug, maybe? For sure, That'd be absolutely. Great. You truly are the best and most gullible dry cleaner in all of New York. That's what they say, that's what they say. All I'll right. see you tomorrow, kid. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, and hey, tell your buddy Banner, get some bigger pants. He's busting through them like crazy. He's pretty angry, but I'll try and tell I'm him. I'm not a miracle worker. Yes, you are, Joe. See you later. Thanks, kid. Hey, Connie, let's go in the back and make love. Okay, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>